Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to our weekly worship service, The Vine, which is the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And we're so glad that you've joined us for worship this week. Uh, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, which means just a few more days until Christmas. Be sure and register your attendance using the QR code and the link that it will, will give you uh, that will be on the screen a little later in the service. Once again, welcome to our service today and let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And now I invite you to join with me as we go before God in prayer. Lord, be with us this morning as we encounter Mary and Elizabeth and hear their songs upon hearing wondrous news. Remind us that like Mary and Elizabeth, each one of us is a bearer of your good news. We are called to proclaim hope, peace, joy, and love in your name. Open our hearts and our spirits today to receive with great joy the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We light this candle as a symbol of the Father's love. May the love of the Father shown in Christ 
lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We have a different affirmation of faith that we're going to be using during this season of Advent. You can follow along with the words on the screen. We believe in God above us, creator of all things, sustainer of all life. We believe in Christ beside us, companion and friend, redeemer of all the broken pieces of our universe. We believe in spirit deep within us, advocate and guide who lives with us eternally. We believe in God's resurrection, created world where all things are fixed and all creation fits together in vibrant harmonies. We believe in God above, beside, within, God yesterday, today, and forever, the three in one, the one in three. We believe in God. Amen. Pastor Julia Crone, one of the associate pastors here, and it is my privilege to get to lead us in prayer this morning. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you for this season of Advent when we prepare for your coming once again. We thank you that like Mary and Elizabeth, we get to gather as witnesses of your mighty acts. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that, inspired like Mary and Elizabeth, we would sing out with joy at your wonderful works. Teach us not to seek power, status, and wealth, but to look instead for how you are being made known among the humble. Teach us to participate in your work of lifting up the lowly and filling the hungry. We thank you for your presence in the world through Emmanuel, God with us. 
We ask that you would be especially, especially and tangibly present with those who we name before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. God, we give you thanks and praise for who you are. Our souls magnify you, Lord, and our spirits rejoice in you, our Savior. And now help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to the time in our service where we have the opportunity to worship God by giving back to God a portion of what God has already given to us. We know that everything we have comes from God. And so our giving is a response to God's generosity, especially recognizing the gift of Emmanuel, God with us. There are several different ways that you are able to give at this time. The first is by writing a check and mailing it to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. You can also give on our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, or using our smartphone app. As we prepare now to worship God through our giving, will you join me in prayer? All things come from you, O oh God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. You created all that is, and with love you formed us in your image. All that we are and all that we have is a trust from you. And so in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have in union with Christ's offering for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Rightsville Kids, I'm Pastor Julia. Today I want to tell you guys about some really cool girls throughout history. The first girl I want to tell you about is actually alive today. Her name is Malala and you might have heard of her. She lives in Pakistan and when she was really young, even like 13, she started getting involved with helping other girls and students to learn to read. You see, where she lives in Pakistan, girls aren't always allowed to read books and get to go to school. And so she decided she wanted to help make it be so that all of the girls her age could go to school. In fact, she did all of this work so well that when she was 17, she got what's called a Nobel Peace Prize, which is kind of like this gigantic award that says you've done something really, really good for the world. She's the youngest person to have ever gotten that award. So that's Malala. The next is from a long time ago, a couple hundred years ago, and her name is Joan of Arc. Now, Joan of Arc lived in France, and when she was 13, she started to have visions of God talking to her and saying that she should be part of the French army, and even though she was a teenage girl, she should go and lead all of these troops. And she did, which was really, really weird at the time because girls were not normally people who got to be soldiers but she was part of that. And now some people even say that she's a saint, which means that she did something really important for God. And all of that happened when she was 16 to 18 or so. The next girl is named Anne Frank. You might've heard of her because um, there's a book called The Diary of Anne Frank. Now she started writing this diary when she was just 13. And she lived in Germany during World War II when some really, really bad, scary, scary things were happening to her and her people. But she wrote down what was happening and what she was thinking and feeling. And so now, even though she is not with us anymore, we have a record of what it was like to be alive at that time. And all of that happened when she was just 13 years old. Now I have one more really cool teenage girl to tell you about, but she is cooler than all of the rest of them put together. Are you ready? Her name is Mary. This is the Mary who is Jesus's mother. Now you might not know this, but Mary was probably actually only 13 or 14 years old when she had Jesus. That was kind of how the culture was back then. People had babies a lot younger. But God used this awesome teenage girl who was just a normal girl. She was just like you or me to accomplish God's work in the world. Because of Mary, we get to know who Jesus is. Now, all of these girls did really cool things. But what's so amazing about Mary is that all that she did started because she said yes to what God asked her to do. God came to her and asked if she would have this baby. And she said, okay, I'm kind of scared, but sure, I'll do your will. And that meant just saying, I'll do your will, God that she is now more important and has done cooler things than any other person ever. So I want you to remember today to listen for what God is calling you to do. 
and remember that you can be part of helping to bring God's kingdom on earth. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for using regular people, even young people, to change your world. Help us to say yes when you ask us to do something. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey there, I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and it is so good to have you worshiping with us on this last Sunday before Christmas. I hope that you will join us again on Christmas Eve as we will have uh, yet another worship, worship service come to you through the vine. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth, <coughs> excuse me, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked down with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord, help us to hear your word and to, as Mary said, let it be according to your word, deep within our own hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you had a chance to look at the sermon title for this week, um, you might think that this was all part of some uh, great plan, but I promise you with the church staff as my witness that I came up with today's sermon title many, many weeks ago with no intention whatsoever that this would be the first Sunday in the sanctuary where we would be singing again. Now, of course, we've been singing at home um, all, all a while, um, but we're going to start singing again here in worship. And our, the theme of today is song. Singing. Mary sings, Elizabeth sings, the angels sing, we sing. What's your favorite Christmas hymn? Not a secular song like, I, all I want uh, for Christmas is you, or I, I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. Not, not, none of those. I mean, I mean the Christmas hymns. Your Silent Night, Your Joy to the World, Charles Wesley's number one greatest hit, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. What is your favorite Christmas hymn. Think about that. If there's somebody near to you who's watching this with you, why don't you share? What's your favorite Christmas hymn? No season of the year sings quite as well as Christmas. The world about us has occasional song fests, you know, as we approach the 4th of July or some school homecoming celebration. But those songs are usually sung by a selected group in an isolated place. Only in the Christmas season does the majority of the population choose to sing or listen to the singing of others. And we do it for weeks. There are radio stations that play nothing but Christmas songs beginning the week of Thanksgiving. Now, as I mentioned, some of the songs which mark the Christmas and Advent season are poor secularizations of the original Christmas theme. 
But even as derivations and deviations from the true theme, they do carry some measure of the joy of the season. Now this isn't surprising because Christmas was born in the midst of song. The Gospel of Luke says it most specifically, but many of us feel it instinctively. Luke tells of the birth of Jesus with song and poetry rather than prose. Zechariah hears that he's going to be a daddy and he sings. Mary hears she's going to be a mama and she sings. As I mentioned, the angels sing, Elizabeth sings, Simeon sings. Everybody's singing in the first couple chapters of Luke. In your own life, you know what this is like, right? You're moving through your day, clothes to wash, emails to return, Zoom calls to log on to. And then there's a funny text from a friend. <coughs> Some good news meets you. And what is your immediate, unconscious, innate response? You sing. Suddenly, quite without any conscious effort, you go about the rest of your day with a song in your head. Mary's good news evoked that same kind of response. But would you sing if you were Mary? After all, Mary's being great with child is not something she could explain or easily understand, not something that Mary had chosen or planned. It put her in a bad way with her fiancé. The angel told Mary to fear not, but old Simeon told Mary the truth of what it meant for her to be blessed among women when he predicted that a sword would also pierce her side. Motherhood was not going to be easy for Mary. But there's another remarkable story, excuse me, remarkable woman in the story too, and that's Mary's cousin Elizabeth. The two were separated in age by probably 20 or 30 years, and though blood relatives, were probably widely separated by social standing as well. Now Elizabeth was the wife of a priest and thus possessed some measure of position, while Mary was no doubt just a peasant girl. But they had in common a deep faith in God and a faithful willingness to be used by him. They were kindred spirits in the most profound sense of the word. Elizabeth and her husband Zechariah had waited through so many years of their marriage for the common miracle of conception, but it never came to fulfillment. Then quite out of the blue, God promised that they would have a son, that his name would be called John, and that he would minister with the spirit and power of Elijah. Nearly six months later, Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel with the message that she had found favor with God and that she would bear a child who would be called the Son of the Most High. When Mary asked how this could be, since she had no husband, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. Then, as if anticipating the uncertainties and fears which lay ahead for Mary, the angel told her that her cousin Elizabeth had also conceived and that she was in the sixth month of her pregnancy. It was as if the angel was saying, I know this is going to be hard for you, but you're going to find a sympathetic, understanding ear in your cousin Elizabeth. So Mary wasted no time in finding her way to Elizabeth's village. She needed desperately to talk with someone who would understand her very particular situation. It had, been, it had to be a person who herself had experienced some kind of miraculous visit from God too. Now, not just like Mary's, but miraculous enough that she wouldn't brush Mary's story aside impatiently with some disbelief and a sneer. No, Mary did well in seeking out Elizabeth. The moment she greeted her cousin, an extraordinary thing happened. As Luke, the physician, reports it, the babe leaped in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's as if John the Baptist already recognized his calling from deep inside his mother's womb. Then Elizabeth spoke. Now, most Bible translators don't set up her words in the structure of poetry, but they have the same rhythm and grandeur of expression as the words of Mary that follow. Elizabeth's words are the simplest kind of testimony. They're marked by gratitude and excitement and are unashamedly personal. She makes no attempt at formal theology. All she wants to do is tell Mary how she feels. She sees herself as a privileged woman 
and she wonders why such favors should come to her. Perhaps the best evidence of the quality of Elizabeth's testimony is to be found in Mary's reply. Mary's response is what we call the glorious Magnificat. Now, if one cannot write a great poem or compose some classical music, surely the next best thing is to inspire such greatness in others. I wonder how many artists could credit a spouse or a friend for the work of genius which came from their brush or their pen. I've noticed that often a minister will note in the preface to a book that she feels indebted to the people of her parish for the help that they've given her over the years. The coals of inspiration are often blown into a flame by someone's thoughtful word or attentive ear. And so it was, it seems, with Elizabeth and Mary. When the angel spoke to Mary, she answered only with questions. But when her cousin spoke to her, Mary cried out, My soul magnifies the Lord. I hope I'm not exaggerating this point too much when I suggest that God spoke to Mary as surely through Elizabeth as he had earlier through Gabriel. I think Mary may have been tied in knots of fear and bewilderment when she came to the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Gabriel's message had perhaps become a dim, mystical thing to her. Doubts and double doubts may have begun to whisper in her ear, had this thing really happened? Having heard from God, Mary needed now to hear confirmation from another human being. Gabriel's majestic voice needed the support of Elizabeth's excited, loving response. And so it could be with you and me. We might well speak the word which could set loose someone else's Magnificat. We might well confirm an uncertain soul. I've known many times when someone spoke just the right words to reassure me, often without knowing what he or she was even doing. Gabriel may have made the motion, but we needed Elizabeth to second it. So I'm urging you in the style of Elizabeth to sing a song of encouragement this week. There could be no more appropriate song for the Advent and Christmas season. Well, speaking of singing, this past week I went to my first funeral in a really long time where we actually sang in the service. Oh my gosh, it was so nice. I promise you that over these last two years of trying to keep the congregation safe while we gathered, there were few people who wanted to sing as much as I do. But it seemed even more profound at this funeral. So often we get in the receiving line in order to greet the grieving family and we think, I don't know what to say. What is there to say in the presence of death? She's better off now. I want you to know we're thinking of you. I guess it was just God's will. The words feel a little trite. So inadequate to meet the moment. Might as well keep silent. And that's what a lot of us do, right? We just keep quiet. We accept it. We resign ourselves. We adjust. We adapt. And the grieving family walks down the aisle of the church in order to confront their loss. And what does the church make them do? The church makes them sing. See them singing through their tears, amazing grace in the garden. It is well with my soul. The church coaxes them to sing even when they don't feel like it. I tell you, such singing is pure defiance. It is a stunning faith, clenched-fisted revolution right in the face of death's tyrannical presence. It's like we're saying, take that, death. We're going to sing about resurrection and eternal life. How do you like them apples? In her singing, Mary becomes the premier disciple, a model for all of us. She's the very first to bear the announcement that God is with us and the first to believe that truth. As Martin Luther once said in a Christmas sermon, three miracles occurred at Christ's nativity. That God became human, a virgin conceived, and that Mary believed. For Luther, the greatest miracle that first Christmas was the last of these, that Mary believed. Despite all the oppression, the closed doors, the brick walls, the blind alleys, the dark, silent death that surrounded her in King Herod's violent rule of Judea, Mary believed, and so she sang. Later in chapter 11 of Luke's gospel, 
when a well-meaning woman pronounces blessings on Jesus' mother, Jesus responds that the blessed are not those who claim biological kinship with him, as in, you know, my family's been members of this church for seven generations. Rather, the blessed are those who hear and do God's word. Mary is called blessed among women because she hears and responds. She sings. Thus, she's a model for all of us and is rightly called the very first disciple. Now, sure, there are going to be dark days ahead for Mary. Her joy as a mother will be mixed with a whole lot of pain, as it is really for most moms. And your life, too, is not all Christmas carols and joy. I get it. Dark, cold January days lie just beyond our Yuletide gladness. The days are short. The nights are long. But for now, our faith enables us to sing. We sing because we believe. We believe as we sing. My soul magnifies the Lord, says Mary, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Are we ready to sing that song? Mary envisioned a day when God would exalt those of low degree. You and I could well be instruments of God in bringing such a beautiful thing to pass. Many people see themselves as persons of low degree even now because they don't receive the attention uh, or just the, have the confidence to restore their egos. In some instances, they need money, in some they need clothing, dental work perhaps, education to restore some lost or maybe never possessed dignity. But in many instances, they simply need the attentive ears of a caring human being. I don't want to over-sentimentalize all this, but I'm sure there are some people whose low estate is not material poverty at all, but are poor in spirit and can be substantially changed just by a word of sincere interest and appreciation. Most of, have, of us have no idea what loneliness and human hunger may exist in the heart of some person, even within our own circle of friends and family. Even people living in physical affluence are sometimes deep down inside convinced that they are of low estate. They need a song of hope and comfort. And it could just be the words that come out of your mouth. It's a season for singing. Elizabeth sang and set loose Mary's song. Mary sang in such a way that the challenge is still upon us today. Now, let us go on with a song in the tradition of Mary and Elizabeth. It doesn't have to be a tune that comes from our lips, but maybe a word of kindness, a gift of money, an ear to listen, a heart to care. These make the music of the season. They are the songs of the Christ who has come and who continues to come through our acts and words of love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, you're an awesome God. That you came to be among us is a miracle. And Lord, we thank you for the songs of the season, and especially the songs that you put on the hearts of two remarkable women, in Elizabeth and Mary. Lord, may we be full of joy and encouragement for others, especially those who may feel as if they are of low estate. Lord, may we hear your song and sing your song this Christmas season. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, it's Christmas week, and we have many ways to celebrate the season this week. And if you're in town, uh, you can come by and celebrate with us tonight in what we're calling Journey to the Manger. This is a drive-through nativity that starts back behind the building we call The Landing over by the Flying Machine Restaurant where we will set up different scenes of the Christmas story as they are acted out and you will drive slowly behind The Landing and then through the church and see the story come to life. It's going to be fascinating. That's from 6 to 8 tonight. I hope that you will take the time to join us this evening. So that's tonight, Journey to the Manger. On Tuesday, it's the longest night of the year. And we have a special service that will come to you online um, that we call Blue Christmas. And it's for those who may be struggling this year. Um, you know, it's been another tough year with COVID. Um, and so, you know, if you're just kind of not quite in the Christmas spirit, we, we get it. And, um, and so we've got a, a, a special service that's designed specifically for you. And so that'll be running throughout the day. And if you'd like to come and visit with one of the pastors, we'll be available from four to six on Tuesday afternoon. Christmas Eve, we'll have five services here at the church. We'll have services specifically for children and families at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. That 11 a.m. service, everyone will be required to be masked. And then we'll have our candlelight and communion services at 3.30, 5 and 730. And we hope that you'll take the time to join us either in person or here online at The Vine, where we will once again have a, a service available to you online. I know a lot of people have been thinking about uh, the victims of the tornadoes in the Midwest and um, across several states um, that took place last week. If you would like to help, um, you can write a check to UMCOR, that's the United Methodist Committee on Relief, U-M-C-O-R, and you can mail that check in here to the church at P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480, or you can even go on the giving tab uh, on our church website, which of course is wrightsvilleumc.org. And last but not least, as we start to look toward 2022, we're going to um, spend some time looking at the intersection of spiritual health and mental health. And we realize that um, a lot of people, again, have been, have been struggling through this year. And, and of course, that's an ongoing um, issue for, for many of us. And we want the church to be a place where you will feel comfortable um, coming to receive uh, assistance. So we're going to start some workshops. Um, we're going to um, make use of uh, professional um, therapists and counselors in the new year. And we want to hear from you. We want to know what your particular needs are. Um, what would you like the church to to share in, in this regard. So there's going to be a survey coming to you this week, and we hope that you'll take the time to fill that out and, uh, and tell us what, uh, what ways the church can help you or perhaps those that you know and love um, in the intersection, again, of spiritual and mental health. Well, as we go through this week, I hope that you will have a song on your lips and a song in your heart, not just for yourself, but to encourage to bring hope and comfort to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>